Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Body Image and Self-Esteem, Part 2, Men's Health. Now, I would like to introduce Lydia Lauder, National Director of Programs and Public Policy at the Kidney Foundation. Thank you, Sadia. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. And thank you to everybody for joining us today for this very important topic, Body Image and Self-Esteem, Men's Health. Before we begin, we would like to recognize the land that we are on. Inspired by the 94 recommended calls to action made by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, land acknowledgements are a necessary first step toward honoring the original occupants of a place. They also help Canadians to recognize and respect Indigenous peoples' inherent kinship beliefs when it comes to the land, especially since those beliefs were restricted for so long. I would like to acknowledge that I am located in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. It is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and is still home to many First Nation, Inuit and Métis people. Recognizing that we all work and live in various places, and that you may be joining us from a different traditional Indigenous territory. I encourage everyone to take a moment to reflect on that and acknowledge it. If you know the territory in which you are situated, I invite you to acknowledge it in the chat. The Kidney Foundation would like to thank our sponsors for this 2022 webinar series. GlaxoSmithKline Canada, Horizon, Janssen, Otsuka, Paladin, and Tagino. The ongoing support allows us to bring many together like today to have broader, bolder, and braver conversations. The Kidney Foundation believes passionately that knowledge is power. Today's goal is to provide you with knowledge, help you understand you're not alone, and ultimately help you feel more empowered. This is the right time to talk about stretch marks, hair and weight changes from medications and treatments, dialysis accesses, dating with CKD, and lots more. The information shared in today's webinar is current of today, October 18, 2022. The material shared in this presentation is not intended to be medical advice. You should speak to your doctor and care team about your own individual situation. This information is intended for a Canadian audience. Now we are thrilled to introduce our speakers. Thank you all for making the time to share this important information today. I would now like to introduce you to our moderator for this webinar, Jose. Jose has 33 years of social work experience with diverse, vulnerable and at-risk adults and seniors with multiple social and health challenges. The focus of his work has been addressing issues of sexual orientation, sexual health, mental health, poverty, and acute and chronic disease management. His experience ranges from clinical frontline work to service coordination, management, research, community advocacy, and program evaluation and development in Canada and in Portugal. He has spent approximately 15 years of his career working in three renal programs in Ontario. Jose has been recognized by his peers as a strong advocate of patient self-determination. Jose, thank you again for moderating and over to you. Thank you very much, Lydia. Again, my name is Jose and I wanted to say thank you for inviting me to do this moderating. Um, welcome everyone. And this is a very important topic that often is not addressed openly or not often enough. Um, body image, self-esteem, um, the impact on mental health and on men living with kidney disease and transplantation is really needs a stronger focus. And our goal today is to get the conversation started and to make sure that you are not alone in this issue. Um, and we have some uh, five dynamic guest speakers who have dealt with this issue for quite some time and have come to a place now where they feel um, empowered to share their experience. So we're gonna start with um, myself introducing one of our speakers, Dan, and then we'll ask each guest to introduce the next one. 
and then we'll get into the fire chat. Dan is a Toronto-based director and co-founder of West Film. He is known for his feature films, White Night, Ashes, and The Family, as well as his work in the Toronto indie music scene with Mono Wales, Birds of Bellwoods, Dahlia. Dan is an advocate for organ donation and the availability of equitable healthcare for all. While directing his film, The Family, Dan was experiencing end-stage kidney failure receiving a kidney transplant just two weeks after the wrap of the, of the film. Since then, he has teamed up with the Kidney Foundation of Canada to help with build awareness. Dan? Thanks, Jose. And thanks for calling us dynamic. I appreciate that. Um, super happy to be here and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, our next speaker, Ali. Um, Ali is 27 years old and was diagnosed with CKD at a very young age. His mother donated her kidney to Ali and was a perfect match in 2003. The kidney worked amazingly for 15 years and failed in 2018. Ali started dialysis. Dialysis. He did in-center hemodialysis, going to the hospital three times a week while balancing his studies and his personal life. In 2021, Ali received a second kidney transplant through the deceased donor list. He is currently working full-time and working hard towards his future. Take it away, Ali. Hi guys. Uh, so the next, uh, so yeah, my name is Ali and uh, the next speaker for us is Loy. So um, <clears throat> Loy was diagnosed with uh, polycystic kidney disease. He received uh, his kidney transplant in 2022 uh, from uh, a donor through the paired exchange program. Prior to surgery, Loy did PD dialysis for more than two years, during which time he was able to live an active lifestyle, included camping, hiking, canoeing, and house care. Thanks, Ali. Okay. Um, I want to, uh, my pleasure, introduce uh, a speaker who I've met recently, and it's Haroop. Uh, Haroop is 23 years old and then is from the Niagara Falls, or is a Niagara Falls resident. Uh, he was diagnosed with uh, CKD, chronic kidney disease, as a child and received treatment at William Osler and Sick Kids. In September 2020, Haroop went into kidney failure during his final year of university and did overnight peritoneal dialysis. In 2022, Haroop received a kidney from a live donor and just recently passed the one-year mark. Congratulations, Haroop. Currently, Haroop is doing his master's in public policy, administration, and law at York University and works within the Niagara region. Thank you so much, Loy. On to the next uh, speaker, uh, which is Joe. Joe's kidney failure for the first time over 15 years ago when he was officially diagnosed with lupus. He has lived with varying stages of chronic kidney disease and ESRD ever since. Joe has experienced with in-center hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, both APD and CAPD. Currently, he, uh, he is having his treatments at his hospital via nocturnal. He's a bit of a uh, couch surfer and travels a lot within Southern Ontario for work and leisure, works part-time as a self-employed technical consultant, is studying towards a degree in the life sciences, volunteers as a peer supporter and group facilitator, uh, facilitator with the Kidney Foundation, and is, of course, a full-time patient too. Almost forgot to unmute. Thanks for the introduction, Herb. Um, I guess everyone's been introduced. That doesn't leave me with much to say, which is unusual for me. So I guess I'll kick it back over to Jose to get us going. Jose, you're on mute. I get too excited and I forget my technical skills. Thank you so much for those uh, great dynamic introductions. We're now gonna start the fireside uh, chat, but before that, I just wanna remind folks that if you have any questions, uh, to go into the um, bottom of the screen and just put it in in the Q&A, and then we'll later 
we will have an opportunity to respond to your questions. Uh, we'll start off the questions then. Um, I will start off the question with Haru. Haru, I know that you um, struggled for a long time with the weight fluctuations due to the kidney disease and, and later transplant. Um, but when you were speaking with me, you talked about a lot of lessons learned as a result of your response to that and adjusting to the weight fluctuation. Can you speak more to what lessons you've learned about the importance of coming to terms with what your body looks like and where things are at? Uh, well, thank you for that question. And uh, before we start things off, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, lessons learned is very um, important as we continue to go through this journey. Um, and I want to take us, um, take everyone through a story, a journey that I've kind of gone through. Um, I've suffered from chronic kidney disease as a child, and it was in university when my kidneys, uh, when I, when my doctor told me I went into kidney failure. And at that time, um, at that time, I was in and outside of the hospital and my weight, of course, was going up and down. And that in itself came with a sense of insecurity, a bunch of insecurities. Um, and through dialysis, it was, it was, um, you know, that weight was continuing to fluctuate. It was going, it was rising a little bit. Um, and then came the transplant luckily, but at that time, um, you know, I got onto the lovely medicine of prednisone, uh, started enjoying my food again, and that weight continued to go up. And all of this time, the insecurities continued to crept up, and um, that really forced me to not take any pictures or even, um, I struggled with looking myself at the mirror, um, because I struggled with where I was and where my body was. Um, and in that time, um, you know, I, I look back on, that, on, on those times, as hard as they were, I try to look at on my phone to see if I captured any memories. And unfortunately I didn't. And now it feels like that whole stage in itself, although I know it in my heart, although I know it in my brain and I feel it every day, um, there's some sense of it that is missing. Um, and how I've kind of come to terms with it now is, is learning and reflecting on where I was and where I am now is understanding my body needed to be where it was to protect um, my kidneys or serve the body where it was. And I think that in itself was really important, was accepting where, where my body was, because that's where it needed to be to do the current things that I needed um, to survive. And accepting that um, changed my mindset a lot and really helped me to enjoy um, the different circumstances I was. In fact, I, um, I just walked the stage for my, uh, for my undergrad this past um, uh, this past week and um, being able to accept where my body was, I was able to really be mindful and present uh, with my family and acknowledge that by taking pictures. And, um, you know, one of the only things I recognize is the smile on my face and my parents' face that we're just able to capture that. And I think the major lesson learned was just accepting that my body needed to be where it was to help me get through the situation I was in. Sorry, you're on mute. Thank you very much. I really appreciate. Um, we'll move on to, unless there's any um, feedback from our fellow panelists, we'll move on to the next question and come back. Is that okay? All right. Um, this question is for you, Dan. Um, I know that as a film director, the head of the team and high energy um, job and keeping everybody motivated to get the task done, you started to, as you, while you were filming, you actually went into kidney failure and um, you needed to struggle to stay healthy and stay fit to continue working. Can you speak more to the pre and post transplant and how your diet changed or improved and what were the challenges? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, first I will just say to Haru, you know, it's, it's funny that you do a lot of these, we speak once a month, we do all this stuff. And I never heard someone say, your body need to be where it was at the time. And I think that's so powerful. So thanks for saying that. Cause I think sometimes we still need to hear that. Um, but yeah, so I was, uh, I was diagnosed with uh, chronic kidney disease or at least the very least when I first started paying any attention to it in uh, when I was 34. So I took a year and a half to just try and maintain the amount of uh, my GFR, my, my kidney function for as long as possible. I was sitting around 20%. 
for that year and a half. And I, I changed my diet completely. I stopped drinking. I was basically only eating red peppers and white rice, um, which is tough. It's not, you get tired of it. Um, so that actually worked pretty well and I maintained it, but I did lose a lot of weight because of it. I think mostly from stopping drinking. And I was very noticeably skinny and people would come up to me on the street and they say, Hey, you've lost weight. Like, is that something you're trying to do? And, you know, I was never a big guy before. So clearly I wasn't trying to lose more weight than I was. So leading into the movie, um, I was, you know, feeling very underweight. Uh, my job is a very high pressure, high intensity, high energy job, and I need to be leading and I need to be leading through my, you know, energy and just kind of pushing everybody to do their best as well. So it was very hard. It was, it was cold. And at that time I felt the cold, like nothing else, you know, I was wearing a parka in early October because I just couldn't get warm. It, it would take, I would have to stand by a heater the whole time. Uh, by the ends of the night, my my legs would swell up so much that I couldn't get my boots off. Um, I couldn't walk up the stairs to get to the set, so I would have to radio to the actors and give them their their action from from my tent, so I didn't have to leave. You know, it it was exhausting. And during that time, my 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 GFR did go down, and I was really fortunate that you know while shooting, they told me that I was going to get my transplant two weeks after. So I made it all the way and then, you know, just went right into the hospital and got the transplant. So, you know, it, I was nervous. It was something that I had to do. It's something that I really considered not doing because I was honestly worried about my life and worried about my health. And I thought maybe it's too big of a, a job right now. But luckily I had people around me who, you know, supported and made sure that I wasn't lifting anything and making sure that I got the rest that I needed and got the food and, and they were making me special meals on set. So I was very fortunate for that. And then the funny thing is, is that a year after, you know, after the transplant, I immediately gained all that weight back and more because as Rup says, you can eat anything. And it took me a while to find that kind of weight balance with, you know, what felt good for me and what, what I could and couldn't eat. And, and, you know, with the medication, it took a while, but after a year, I talked to a few people that worked on the movie with me and I, I don't think they knew what I was going through. And I, and I told them and, and they said, no, they, they didn't have any idea. They never saw those moments where I thought I was too tired. They never saw the moments where I couldn't walk upstairs. So I think I was just being very hard on myself because you, you know, you know, you pay attention to yourself way more than anybody else does. So it, it's just a good lesson in that it's probably never as a big deal to anybody else. And then also you just, you need to ask for help for some people to get through those moments. So yeah, I'm really glad I did it. You know, I think it would have been such a, a, a waste if I, I didn't. So I, I'm really glad I pushed myself at that moment. Thank you, Dan. Um, we're gonna go on then to Ali. Um, Ali, you, you're on your second transplant. And when we spoke earlier, I was quite impressed on how you have such a positive attitude about uh, your life at this stage at 27, even though you've started this journey, I think in your elementary school. Can, yep. you, share, can you share with us um, some of those challenges and how you are now arrived at a place where you can be comfortable sharing your story with on a date or with a friend or family? Can you comment on, on what lessons you've learned? Um, <clears throat> so, the lessons I've learned uh, throughout the last uh, past years um, as a patient, um, as a dialysis patient and as a transplant patient, um, the things that I went through as a kid, um, if I'm being completely honest, I've never, at the, when I was a kid, I never really realized I was sick because I was already transplanted uh, without dialysis, right? Like in 2003, you know, within seven months, my mom donated me a kidney. So transitioning from like you know from that age from 80 years old until you know a little after high school um it never really hit me because I never had that idea of oh I'm a, I'm a patient I'm a you know this can always come to an end right I never had that idea but when I started to feel the symptoms of getting sick and uh in, in 2018 um is when I started to realize okay you know what like this isn't something that I'm gonna have forever um and that kind of took a huge, that was a huge life lesson that at the end of the day, I'm always going to be a patient. Um, so yeah, no, I learned a lot in terms of um, 
you know, things aren't forever in terms of, you know, health wise, you always, you always got to take care of yourself. And I was really closed off in the beginning. Um, and I didn't really want to talk to anyone about it. I was just kind of alone. And that hit me a lot also because the more you close yourself off, the more sad you're going to be, the more negative thoughts you're going to have on, on your, on your health. And, <clears throat> and after a year of dialysis, I finally started to open up about, you know, whether to my friends, to my, to my family or about just, you know, me being depressed, you know, oh, my life is on hold. And because there's so many plans that I had in mind for myself. Um, and it took a lot, but in terms of support wise, I realized when I started to open up how much support I really had and how important support really is when you're going through something, whether it's family, whether it's friends, whether it's a significant other, uh, it really helps you excel. Um, and for me, I felt like when I finally started to open up, I started to see life differently. I'm like, okay, you know what? I have the support. I, I just got to be positive until, until the end. And, you know, I was always sad about, oh, my life is on hold. I can't be, you know, I'm losing weight. Um, just like Dan said, he, I was wearing, you know, extra clothing in the summer because I was so cold. You know, I, I lost so much weight. I was at like, I think I was like a hundred pounds and I was started to feel insecure about my weight. This was all like, you know, when I was feeling sick before dialysis and and finally, I started to realize, you know what, like, I got to be comfortable with myself also, right? I'm sick and I just got to accept that. And obviously, after transplant, I started to gain my weight back. I started to, after six months, I started going to the gym again. I started working full time and that helped a lot in terms of, you know, finally getting my positivity back. And um, now I'm seeing life uh, in a completely different way as like, you know, there is always you know, you just got to be patient. Like a patient is a virtue. You know, you got to, there's going to be life at the uh, light at the end of the tunnel. You just got to be patient with things. And um, for me now, it's more of just um, finally coming to an understanding that I'm healthy again, but at the same time, I got to take care of myself in order to keep this going. Right. So this is one experience that I've learned is, and the lesson that I learned is, I have to take care of myself. This, this kidney isn't going to just work itself. It's not going to just, you know what I mean? Like last forever. I got to take care of it. And the lesson that I learned, I don't want to go back to being sick again. That was one of the worst experiences I've ever had in my life. Um, so that's my experience in terms of as a, as a patient, I've been dealing with this since I was a kid. But the thing is, as a kid, you don't understand what you're really going through. Um, you realize it when you're an adult, when life hits you, when like, you know, when you can't work, when you can't see your friends all the time, when you can't, you know, there's, can't go on dates at times because you're so insecure about certain things, for example, like center line and things like that. So. Thank you, Ali. That's a good segue to our next uh, speaker, Loy, because he's comfortable in sharing uh, with us um, what, physically what the lines look like. And so Loy, can you speak to your need for self-care? Um, at the time you were a young dad and you had to negotiate a recovery time and, and self-care with your, your partner and your kids. Can you speak to that, Loy? Yeah, thanks Jose. And I wanna say, I'm just so uh, proud to be on this panel. I've met everyone on this panel face to face and I'm just so proud to hear everyone's story and to uh, be able to collaborate with everybody on this panel. Thanks for the question, Jose. I wanna take everyone through a bit of a journey over the last four years. I've got a prepared slide. I'm gonna talk about a few things uh, in each and every year. Uh, this particular year uh, was 2019. It really starts in 2019 when I was feeling scared and worried. Uh, my medical team had told me that I'm gonna to have to start dialysis in the next probably six to 12 months. And that um, uh, I was advised to start looking for a living donor. I, I, just really felt like I was backed in a corner. Uh, and, and I didn't know anybody that uh, had kidney disease as well. Uh, my wife, uh, she works in uh, the medical field, but uh, she's just learning about kidney disease as well. My kids were quite young. They were seven and eight at the time uh, in 2019. And uh, you know, uh, we didn't share too much about the gravity of my health situation. 
but uh, you know, camping uh, has always been something that I've been able to get a lot of uh, sort of uh, self care and a lot of just introspective um, joy. Um, and you know, it's something I have always wanted to share uh, with my kids and my family, no matter what was going on um, health wise. Um, so uh, there was some hope at the end of 2019, I was able to meet uh, someone on this panel, Joe, and it was the beginning of developing a kidney community for myself, which helped out greatly. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. At the end of 2019, I got my PD catheter uh, inserted. The surgery was uh, uh, not fun, to say the least. Um, the good thing about my PD catheter, I never had any issues with it, uh, no infections. Uh, the string that you see around my neck held the catheter securely in any activity that I did. And I uh, did uh, remain active uh, while I was uh, on dialysis. Uh, and um, you can see my body here. Uh, I was recommended to keep the same body weight uh, as I was doing dialysis. I was uh, 75 kilos throughout that period. And um, yeah, looking at it now, uh, you know, I'm just, you know, really grateful of uh, had chosen PD as it really matched uh, my lifestyle. I was able to travel uh, and use manual bags or bring uh, the actual machine with me. Uh, next slide, please. So 2020, again, just continue on with the summer tradition of going camping. Uh, 2020, I really felt um, uh, grateful to have, uh, I guess, discovered dialysis as a treatment and um, uh, really uh, just felt hopeful about the situation. Uh, you know, I was able to get my, um, my dialysis process dialed in pretty quickly. And uh, that gave me a big sense of relief. You know, when you walk into something like kidney disease and then having to go through dialysis, uh, just, I just didn't know what to expect. So I was just so relieved after a couple months of dialysis, I, I just felt great about the treatment and, and uh, what it was doing for me. Uh, at this stage, I was showing my kids my catheter and uh, explaining a little bit about my, what my machine was doing for me. Uh, they weren't too interested in it, um, but uh, you know, uh, we were slowly getting the information out uh, to my kids. Uh, and you know, my wife and I felt that was important as what I have is polycystic kidney disease and it can be hereditary. Uh, and so you know, keeping things transparent was something that we always wanted to do for our kids. Uh, next slide, please. Again, this is in 2021. Uh, and um, uh, uh, this particular year, I started getting uh, uh, phone calls to be uh, the backup for a kidney transplant. And so this was a year after starting dialysis, about a year starting dialysis. And, you know, it just, it just renewed my vigor for life. Uh, like I, I just knew I was going to get a kidney now. It's just a matter of surviving this period of time of dialysis, which was not great. Um, for me, PD dialysis became something that I just had to survive. My prescription was increasing every six to eight months. And uh, a few months after this picture, I had to start day dwells, which means liquid would have to stay in my stomach, enlarging my stomach quite big. And, and having to just manage that liquid all day. And then the liquid would drain. And then I would start my treatments overnight as I normally did previously. Um, uh, and, uh, but again, uh, it was just a matter of survival at this stage, uh, going through um, you know, what I was going through. Uh, my wife, she's just an incredible supporter and also uh, incredible, uh, I guess, I want to say cheerleader, uh, but more than that, she really just pushed me to continue to be uh, active. Uh, so one example, uh, uh, I took some time off uh, late in 2021, and she pushed me to do the flooring in my house. So this is, involves ripping the carpet out, cleaning up the floor, and then laying down uh, the, the hardwood. Um, and to this day, every time I walk on my hardwood floors, I... I, I I can't believe I did this while I was on dialysis. I, I just, I almost feel like it was a dream. Like it's just so surreal given 
everything that was going on in my life, the energy, the cramping, uh, having to hook up at, at night, the day dwells. Uh, it just was so much stacked on and I had done the flooring uh, during that period of time. I, I, just, uh, I just find it incredible. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is uh, just a few months ago, uh, uh, we're camping uh, and I have a new kidney in my belly. Uh, I've, I've actually lost 20 pounds uh, just by eating differently. It wasn't something that I was uh, trying to do. I, I just wanted to eat differently now that I had a, a kidney. Ali referenced something about, you know, you got to take care of your kidney. It's so, so true. And, uh, you know, with my uh, medications that I have, I, you know, I just try to take them on time every time. And, um, you know, uh, now that I have a kidney, uh, my main initiative with my kids is to really uh, just try to change their perception of me. And then I think back when I was doing dialysis, I always tried to just take care of myself, knowing that I need to take care of myself so that I could be around for my kids down the road. And thank goodness I, you know, thought that way because now that I have a kidney, it's just an incredible feeling to see my body um, uh, doing so well, reacting so well to exercise that uh, I'm able to put it through. Uh, this particular camping trip is a, um, it's a very large campsite. It's a group campsite that accommodates 50 people. You can see a bunch of tents in the back there. And uh, the camp setup was quite involved. I had to move a lot of stuff uh, about 50 feet away from the car and then set up the tent, set up the tarp and all the other camp uh, equipment that went with it. And um, it was quite grueling, but yeah, I mean, uh, I did it and it felt different this time than when I was on dialysis. And uh, I've been able to accomplish a lot since getting my kidney, actually. Uh, and uh, I'm just looking forward to building a, a different relationship now with, uh, with my kids. Um, so and anyways, in a nutshell, that's uh, my presentation. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Oh, uh, the last final thing I would say. Uh, the reason why I picked all these photos was just to let everyone know to continue to do the things that you love. And that will always, um, you know, help you get through, uh, you know, whatever situation uh, that you're in. For me, camping was my outlet. And I wanted to share that with my family. And I wanted to continue sharing that with my family, no matter what was going on health wise. And so that, that's the, uh, the last word I would leave with everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, that's very, very um, appreciative of sharing the pics as well. It helps to concretize what, what people go through. Thank you so much. Last but not least, Joe, uh, we're gonna come to you now for your question. So Joe, you too have had issues around weight, um, muscle mass and strengthening, and you've always had an active lifestyle, but you, and you have been on dialysis now, I believe over 15 years. Can you talk to us about how you cope with the ups and downs of your energy and uh, low hemoglobin, and iron, and how do you remain positive and focused on staying active? Yeah, that's a lot of stuff to cover, <laughs> uh, but it's good because uh, it's really great to be here and hear everybody else's stories because I'm seeing that the weight is a theme, uh, a lot of common themes among us uh, that a lot of us are dealing with. So I'm hoping the folks at home are also uh, get be able to relate to some of the things we're discussing today and yeah I guess I'll just hop right in but uh, just to cover a few things that everybody else said uh, Harup you were talking about prednisone and how it's quite the doozy of a drug and I think anybody of any gender is probably that's been on that medication knows you know what havoc that can wreak on body weight and and everything else like I know uh, and just kidney disease in general the swelling the edema packing on extra fluid like when my kidneys first failed, like I, I, I was young, I was still, you know, working my first job. I was, you know, it was a relatively physical job. So I was, you know, decently healthy without trying too hard. Average weight of around 165 pounds. And then, you know, as the kidney started to fail and fluid was just building up, it ended up being, you know, around 210 to 220 by the time, you know, I got a diagnosis and ended up in emerge in an acute, you know, very serious emergency crash situation. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, and that was, uh, you know, and that's when I got put on the prednisone to try to get the lupus under control. And as, as, as people have kind of mentioned, it's, it can do a lot to you. So at that body weight um, and increasing that body weight so quickly and then being on the prednisone, which makes the skin weak, um, it just like tore apart 
all my skin, just all over. I have stretch marks literally everywhere. And uh, they're very, very prominent too. And, it, you know, a lot of that was just from the prednisone and, and, and the, the immense weight gain. And it was so much weight, it was really shocking because like by the time I had taken about over a month to stabilize in the hospital from all this, get the lupus under control, get my get enough dialysis to, to pull off all this extra fluid. And I think I left at about 125 pounds. So, you know, that's a, almost a almost 100 pounds of, of lost weight, including muscle mass and uh, just healthy tissue as well as overloaded fluid. And that's about 40 weight pounds down from where I was at a sort of a healthy weight going in. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that prednisone is, I can totally relate to you there, Harup. It's, it's really a ton of number on me. And, and I always kind of joke, I was like, well, I, I always wanted to be shredded, but that's not quite what I had in mind. <laughs> but here we are, like they were prominent enough that uh, I ended up getting a referral. My nephrologist saw them and he's like, I'm going to refer you to see like a cosmetic surgeon and see if those can be fixed. And I was like, oh, I'm not really bothered about them. But he's like, you're just so young and they're just so obvious, you know, that maybe we should see what they can do. Obviously, there's no cure for that. So I still have them. I wish I'd been more prepared. Like Loy, I could have uh, had some pics for you of uh, just to show you how systemic those are. But yeah, they are quite, quite all over. But yeah, to speak to the weight gain, the strength, um, that was a real shocker for me, that first kidney failure, uh, being in the hospital and in bed rest, you know, barely able to support that ex excess weight on my body. Um, you know, the prednisone helping with uh, losing muscle mass and suddenly having a much lower calcium, like a lower diet in terms of protein and calories being in the hospital. Um, yeah, when I got out, I was just shockingly weak and I didn't even necessarily realize it at first. I remember I had a, I was decided I was going to take a, some transit to get downtown and, and I was walking out to the bus stop and I saw the bus coming and I was like, oh, I better hustle. So I just tried to jog, you know, something I would take for granted any time before this, you know, no big deal, just got to run for the bus. And as soon as I took that first step, you know, put all my body weight on one leg, it was immediately obvious to me that, you know, this isn't going to happen. Like there is just, I could not support my own body weight, even though I was so light that I just lost so much strength that I just took one lurching step and just evasive maneuvers just rolled into the snowbank and laid there and watched the bus go by thinking like, what just happened? You know, like, where did, where did this go? Where did all my strength go? Um, so it was a real, a real awakening experience. And I, from then on, I kind of had to do a lot to sort of get back even basic functionality. Uh, I started with um, Tai Chi, doing uh, just an, a, a number of different Tai Chi uh, uh, exercises, doing them at home, going to the classes. And that kind of got me back to a regular physical level of being able to walk and support my own weight. And then kind of from there, you know, learning the kidney diet, like Dan was talking about, you know, trying to find things you can eat that, you know, will help you gain weight, help support that growth. Cause it's always a challenge, but especially a challenge when you have to watch potassium, sodium, phosphorus, you know, you don't want to get too much phosphorus, but all protein has phosphorus, almost all anyway. Um, so it's really hard to walk this fine line. I really, really related to you, Dan, when you're talking about eating plain white rice and, and, and red peppers, <laughs> you know, it's, I've certainly been there, you know, just can't put soy sauce on it. You can't really do it. Like, I think I did like turmeric and ginger powder and just stirred that in just to give it some essence of flavor, you know, and it takes a long time for your palate to adjust to that, that lack of sodium. Um, but yeah, you know, I used to do lots of crazy stuff trying to keep blood pressure under control, like just eating like, like plain oats, plain oats, like an oatmeal and like some natural peanut butter, zero, you know, zero sodium. <laughs> so yeah, it's a challenge because the other, the other facet of it is kidney disease often leaves you feeling nauseated if your treatment isn't, you know, really well dialed in. And then I was taking um, some immunosuppressive medications common for transplant to keep the lupus under control. And when your kidneys fail, you, like I had, had been on this drug for like 10 years and it was no problem. But as soon as the kidneys failed, all of a sudden it was just GI symptom nightmare. And I had to live with that for like years, constant nauseation, you know, uh, frequent like, watery bowel movements, the whole thing, right? And it's really tough to eat, especially eat a lot when it's not super palatable to begin with. And then you're trying to force yourself to consume that um, in this state of feeling ill. So you know, it was very difficult. I, I struggled with weight for a very, very long time. Um, it took years and years to even get like 10 pounds 
kind of on. And it seemed like along the way, there was just endless setbacks too. Like uh, there was always something going on, um, you know, like it would be, I was doing PD and the PD's prescription was slowly, as my urine output went down, the PD's prescription was no longer sufficient. But so it would sort of like, eventually the toxins would start building up, but the blood work mostly looked good. So then I'd have these things like uremic pericarditis and I'd be hospitalized all over again. And, and uh, you know, you're, you're on bed rest for a while and you're kind of regressing. And I had another case with like some antibiotics that um, it turns out I have a rare side effect to them where I was susceptible to damage in the inner ear that destroyed my vestibular system. So I completely lost my sense of balance. And it was another sort of rude awakening. I, I woke up one morning and, and the damage had been done. And I just took that one step out of bed to get up and just, again, fell right to the floor. Was, you know, I just, it's not that I wasn't strong enough to stand. It's just, I couldn't figure out how to balance on one leg all of a sudden, you know, this is something I've intrinsically done my entire life. Uh, so again, like things like that, you know, having to relearn to walk, you know, and get your balance back made it very difficult to pursue any type of continuous strength training. You know, you've got a lot big load on your back if you're trying to do squats or whatever. And it's pretty hard to not fall backwards when you, you can barely stand up straight. Um, you know, I, so, and, and later on, even just recently, I had two other it's like occurrences, kind of setbacks. I had a, a case of my hemoglobin just dropping really, really low. Um, again, it was sort of inadequate dialysis. Um, it was kind of suppressing the bone marrow function. So for six weeks in hospital, we tried to figure it out. You know, again, lots of bed rest, not enough energy to basically do anything. You know, like I'm, I'm sitting around like a low 50. People are, you know, they want you to do a blood transfusion, but I'm so close to transplant. I don't want to take any chances of building up antibodies, you know, causing any complications. So, you know, I just try to tough it out. And again, just a long, you know, use it or lose it, right? So every time you're hospitalized like this, it kind of just sets you back. And recently I had a clot on a CVC catheter that uh, blocked the superior vena cava. So all the blood flow that kind of comes back from your brain and your arms, it couldn't, couldn't travel through back to the heart very well because it, that whole space was restricted. And so again, I just, I, then this time I had, the ability to, to metabolize oxygen, but I couldn't get the blood around fast enough. So, you know, again, it was months of recovery, just taking it super easy, trying not to stress the heart because, uh, you know, it's got a pump against this and, you know, it makes you dizzy. You feel like you're going to pass out because you're not getting enough oxygen to your brain because you just can't get enough blood there, um, you know, under, under stress, like if you're exercising and things like this. So, you know, so it's been, it's been a long journey and uh, it's, it's a tough one too, because as a guy, you know, there's a certain perceived expectation and obviously maybe this isn't the way it has to be, but typically you want to feel strong. You want to be out there and be unstoppable. And like Dan was saying about being the man on set, sort of, you know, everyone's looking to you to sort of, and like I'm self-employed, so I didn't have, you know, a whole team that were looking up to me and, and trying to be that, that icon for them. But still, you know, it, it really makes you question or maybe feel a little bit, you know, like, have I lost that, that masculinity that I had, you know, like, how, how do I adapt to that? And uh, so it's been a long time of trying to get that strength back and, and, uh, and sort of get that body image back. Um, and, you know, it, and I, I think I've come through it pretty good. Like, I'm, I'm in pretty good spirits about the whole thing. And I like the scars. I, I like that. I think the ports are interesting. You know, it's, 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 I find them medically interesting, which that, which keeps me, you know, very interested and engaged. Like, you know, it, it's really cool even though it's happening to me I think it's really cool what we're able to do and and and, and with all of this so that keeps me pretty motivated and as to your question about you know how do you keep the energy I, I think that it's sort of just just grit just mental fortitude sort of even though you're feeling it just trying to say like I had all these things planned and I'm not going to cancel them I'm just gonna push through you know uh, if I if I have to like hold the walls and, and crawl along because I, I'm struggling with my balance, then I'm still going to do it. I'm still going to go there. I'm not going to stop doing these things. Right. So, um, just, they take longer, they might take longer, but if you're committed and just, just push through, like, you know, never say no, just do the things or if someone invites you out, you go and yeah, you're feeling it, then maybe try to take a break or, or whatever. But, uh, once you're kind of there, you get that extra bit of adrenaline and you're, you're, you it'll help push you through and, it makes you stronger, I think, for just, just keep on trying. Um, I think I've probably talked a lot, so <laughs> maybe I turn it back to you, Jose, and just make sure everybody else gets some good talk time. Thank you, Joe. I, I know that Haroop has to leave shortly, and I just want to give yes. him a last chance to respond to anything he's heard from 
from his fellow um, speakers uh, or comments that he would like to make before he needs to leave the panel. <clears throat> well, thank you so much. And I just, um, you know, I reflect on the conversations that have happened. And I think it goes back to the grit, the dedication and the perseverance, and most importantly, having a strong support system around you. Um, and and I in in turn you define what that support system means for me. Uh, that support system met my family, uh, definitely my sisters, and also the Kidney Foundation. Um, leaning onto those support groups, it was um, you know it played a very pivotal moment in my journey, and it helped to um, give me the strength it needed at uh, various moments uh, to push through. Um, and I think just um, that idea of it will get better. Um, that everything is bound to get better. There is light at the end of the tunnel, although it may be difficult, it may be very hard to do what you're doing right now, it will get better. And um, having that belief, um, it, in the worst of times, there was times that I leaned on my faith as a sidebar. Um, and my sister told me this a lot, a lot of times, it's God will never give you more than you can handle. Um, and I really believe that. Um, and just having that sense of belief um, the need to push through was really important and also having other goals that you could always look to to see what other things that were needed i think that really helped in that journey thank you very much well stated i'm just inviting now um, everyone else to comment on what they've heard and um, i know there's a lot of um, common themes around motivating uh, yourself and reaching out to others i'm just wondering if others have comments uh, or statements what they've heard or questions of each other. Um, yeah, I was actually, when uh, Ali, when you were talking about, about your story, and I know kind of central to your theme, you were talking a little bit about dating. Maybe I'll throw you a quick question that I've kind of uh, had come up. Uh, I, I've posed to a few um, support groups. And, uh, sure. is, and that, that is, uh, if you're using online dating or just even dating in person, um, when do you reveal your kidney disease? You know, do you put it in your profile? Are you upfront about it? Do you try to conceal it? You know, I, I think there's a lot of ways to approach that and I'd be really curious to see how you did it. Um, yeah, that's actually a really good question. Um, <laughs> so for me, it was more of um, like while I was on dialysis, I didn't really bring it up until it was more of like, I was comfortable saying it you know what i mean like it wasn't I, I wouldn't say it like right off the bat like hey like i'm a dialysis patient like this and that like i feel like that kind of throws a lot of people off like before you even get to kind of know somebody right um especially because at the end of the day when you have a center line like it's and you know what i mean like things ex escalate <laughs> um it's gonna you know what i mean it's gonna show up one one way or another right so but for me it was more of when I got serious is when I kind of revealed that, hey, listen, like, I am going through this and I have something on my chest. Uh, it's not as normal. <laughs> it's, uh, it's something that's uh, important. And I just asked if, you know, if they're comfortable with it or not. And uh, it, all, it all depends on the other person, right? If, they're, if they feel comfortable with it or not. At the end of the day, you got to let them know, right? Uh, but it all depends on how things escalate, how things, you know what I mean, end up. Mm -hmm. um uh, in a like for example like if you're in a if you're get, uh, getting with someone and you want to get serious with someone uh definitely you have to say you have to let them know right like your history you got to let them know what you've gone through because like they deserve to know right someone that i'm saying someone that you're, you're you want to be serious with or you know see a future with but in terms of like, just a like casual it was more of just uh when the time came if you if you get what i'm trying to say <laughs> yeah definitely yeah so i mean profile wise and stuff like that i never did it i i, I kind of just like i don't need to to be honest um but yeah that 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 was my approach in terms of letting you know people know did anybody if not, ever did anybody ever say they weren't comfortable uh if I'm or did you get a weird look like if i'm being completely honest with you never um yeah like of course they would ask that one like you know question of why is it there or you know what i mean but you gotta obviously let them know why mm -hmm. it is there you know why you have it and things like that but 
in terms of uh, weirded out and stuff like no not if i mean like in my experience of course like everyone i'm sure everyone has different experiences with different type of people but in my experiences i've i've never had like a weird feeling of like hey what the hell is that <laughs> that's awesome i think it's yeah. a good message to you to know that for anybody yeah. else who out there is struggling with you know looking in the mirror and saying wow that Ex looks weird you know don't try exactly. not to feel that way yeah no i at the end of the day it's a part of you, right? When, you, when you're on Dallas, it's a part of you. So you have to accept that. And if the other person is not willing to accept it, then they're not that person for you. That's what I'm going to say. That's an awesome way to put it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is a part of you and it's yeah. equally as important as my little finger, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Actually, I could probably go without my little finger. So it's probably more important, really. <laughs> <laughs> Can anybody else have any comments or share something on what they've heard? with each other or the last uh, thing about the dating? I just think it's such a practical approach, you know, like that's like, a, you know, you're living with it and, you know, as opposed to making it everything about you, you're not, but then you're also not hiding behind it in any kind of way. And that's what you need to do with life in general anyway. So I don't know, that's like, I think it's good on you for being that comfortable, but also, you know, not making it everything and not overthinking it because that's sometimes very easy to do. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, in terms of what I've heard, there was a lot of issues around needing to, there's initially one thing that you didn't mention, but I would like to mention is that there is a grieving that happens when you first get you know, diagnosed uh, with kidney failure. Um, there's definitely an interruption to your, where you are in your life, whatever stage you are, if that's in school or work, uh, in relationship or beginning to explore relationships. And I think what I've heard, which is really important, is that at some point, um, you know, this conversation unfortunately isn't always opened up with patients or people living with the issue. And there's almost a, a sense that you have to kind of make a decision, okay, how am I going to be with this? And what I heard people say is you need to, there is a time that you need to withdraw, but you actually need to reach out. And I'm wondering if you can talk about how you stay open to um, building your confidence and, and building yourself, your personhood and respecting yourself and where you're at and kind of sharing that. And who do you decide and how to share it with? I think um, I just have to say bye now. Uh, Take you care, everyone. See you bye, everyone. Take care. Good right. seeing you. Bye. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Yeah, I think with what you're talking about, you know, there certainly is a, you know, a period where you're like, you know, why me? And what is this? I knew nothing about it. And, you know, even, you know, listening to all of you talk, especially Joe, like you just, you know, so much. And I think that's obviously how you, you know, deal with it in the way that you just knowledge is how you get through these things. And my way was like, how can I learn as little as possible and just focus on feeling good? Like, I didn't want to learn the words. I didn't want to get too ahead of myself. I didn't learn about dialysis. And I thought if I was going to have to go on dialysis, I'd learn about it then. So I just focused on the things that I can control. So for me, that was my diet. So, you know, I think that after the first initial couple of days, I just thought I'm going to learn everything about the diet and, you know, what's good for you, what's bad for you, what to avoid, how to maintain weight. You know, I, I was really trying, I was eating a lot of carbs to try and maintain that weight. And even that wasn't doing it. And then eventually I went to my doctor and I said, look, like I'm still losing, you know, a pound a week at this rate, I'm going to be like sickly small, you know? And that's at the point that they said there was this drink called Suplena, um, which is a carb based drink and it has 500 calories. And then I drank one of those every single day and they're not great. But if they're really cold and you put them in a milkshake, like you put some of that in some almond milk or something or coconut milk is what I was doing. Um, you know, they're pretty good actually with some blueberries, but you know, that was one thing I could just do. So I think it was, I, I just dialed into what I could control and just focused on that. And then when the kidney function started going down, I switched to the next part of that and how to control that. And I, I imagine you guys probably did a very similar thing. Yeah. I could certainly relate. And, and you're very right, spot on when you say that that's sort of my coping mechanism is to get all obsessive about the details. Um, I kind of like 
I guess, accept the reality of the situation very quickly, but the, like, I'm, I'll be super anxious about it if I don't like read a whole bunch and like feel like I have some control in that scenario and that like, I understand what's happening. It's not spiraling away from me, right? Like, oh, that's just this, or that's just this, like, I understand it. Um, yeah, that's I like how you're describing. If I could shout out for those 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 drinks like you were just talking about, also things like Nepro and Nova Source, like there's some specific ones formulated for kidney patients. And it's a great way to get a ton of um, protein with uh, with with reasonable phosphorus and other things. So I also like how you're describing, oh yeah, they're not the greatest, but if you add all these other things, then suddenly it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, you make do somehow for sure. But yeah, I, wanna, I wanted to add uh, to Dan's thing where like, you know, you're kind of unaware of what's exactly going on. Like, you know, like the whole dialysis thing. Like, I feel like I feel like for me, it was more of like being uneducated on dialysis on like I didn't know what comes with dialysis, what the you know, the diet restrictions that came with dialysis. And I feel like that was something that was really hard for me to, to kind of, uh, you know, cope with, especially, you know, when you the decrease of um fluid intake in urine uh that was something that really really hit me hard and uh, that was really really hard to you know hard to deal with so i feel like a lot of people that you know are about to go on dialysis is very very important um to learn about dialysis and what comes with dialysis because once you are on dialysis and you don't know what's happening you're going to be so lost and you're going to keep questioning as to like you know you're going to, you're going to always feel bad and like, you know, sick and stuff. Like for me, like when I first started Dallas, I had no clue what dialysis even was like that. I have to live through this and things like that. Right. So I feel like that's something I really wanted to touch on to be, you know, before going into dialysis, it's very important to be educated on it. Wow. Thank you, Ali. I'm just wondering, there's a question in the box. Uh, how do people cope with the stretch marks? Can you comment on that? Anyone? Yeah, um, what can I say about that? I mean, for me, I kind of just own them. Like, uh, I try to think that in a way they kind of make me look sort of, I don't know, what's the term? I want to say bad, you know? Like there's a certain amount of like intensity. Sometimes I just joke about them. Like some of them are like really long and really wide and up the side and I'll maybe joke that, you know, I had a, had a tussle with a bear, you know, and I won or, you know, the joke about being shredded is one I use a lot, you know, oh, that's probably not what you had in mind when you asked for someone shredded, right? Um, I think, yeah, just like stretch marks happen. I think like for so many people have them and obviously with the kidney disease, they can often be far more, like far worse and far more pronounced. And I can certainly see why I would, you know, they certainly can maybe take a hit to your, how you feel when you look in the mirror and feel like, oh, I wish, you know, I wish those weren't there, but obviously that can't happen. So I think the best thing to do is just try to make peace the best you can. And honestly, I think that anybody that you're, you know, meeting that gets, you know, close enough to you to see them um, is probably not going to care as much as you do. I mean, I, I know it seems like cliche advice that everybody probably gives, but it's just like another thing that's, it's part of you, right? I think that once they get to know you and, and know your story and like that kind of captures your journey. And I think they're going to see that as well to see like, hey, this is part of the story of who you are. And it's sort of like having a tattoo, right? Like, even though it's a really big one that you didn't want, <laughs> you know, and it's, but it's, it's an interesting story. And I think that, you know, people will appreciate that and, and they won't see it in as negative light as you do, if that helps. <laughs> Anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, I think that just even just goes along with scars to, you know, I was so worried about the scar leading up to the transplant. Like I didn't know what it was gonna look like. It's a hard thing to ask people about. And, but I, you know, I have tons of scars. I have a scar from when I broke my leg. I have a scar from when I fell through a plate glass window. You know, it's just, it's just stories you can tell. And I think the scar looks kind of cool. And yeah, I think, I think, as you said, you just embrace it, you know, because it's not gonna change. And I think that it gives you a, a better story. Yeah. I think you're right. I, the sense of humor that Joe was referring to and Dan's around, just have to come to terms that this is the way it is and you can't change it, kind of helps you move beyond. But it takes time for different people to address that. Um, and different people have a different feeling about 
the physical body, right? We all are exposed to social media. And I'm just wondering how you as men on dialysis or transplant, how do you cope with, you know, this, this image of the new man or what a man looks like these days? Any comments on the social media and how it impacts on your personhood, your self-esteem regarding your body image? I actually throw one more thing about the stretch marks. I think the, the important part about owning it is just to be confident and project that confidence because if you're confident with it, that will tell whoever is looking at them everything they need to know. Um, you know, confidence has always been like a really key personality trait for guys. And I think that if you have that, it'll totally trump any amount of stretch marks or scarring. I completely agree with that. For a man, it's always about their personality and how funny they are and <laughs> things like that. <laughs> Lloyd, would you like to comment on this? Um, yeah, as a father uh, and having two boys, um, uh, uh, being able to do things uh, during dialysis was difficult. And I'll give you a specific example. Um, I changed the winter tires. Um, or the tires of my cars uh, during spring and, and winter. And during dialysis, uh, you know, it was really, really tough to do. Um, but I did it. And, you know, I told my kids, yeah, you know, I, I changed the tires. And, you know, doing the flooring, that, that, that piece as well, it, it just, you know, it's something that I, I wanted to do just to let my kids know, like, you know, I'm going through a difficult time and I'm going to get these things done, but I'm going to do it maybe a little slower than what maybe dad used to do it but I'm going to get it done. And that's was what happened. And um, yeah, I, I mean, there is a bit of a stigma. I feel it uh, being, you know, a father and, and being, uh, mas uh, being a man, but um, I see it both ways in terms of, you know, just trying to keep a balance. And that's what I, uh, I wanted to always let my kids know that, you know, it's okay if you're not okay, but you know, you can still push on and listen to your body and just do it at whatever speed that you can do it at. Yeah. Just to comment on like the new man thing on Instagram, like I think the, the benefit of where the world's going is that there is a move away from this idea of being masculine all the time and, you know, super strong and all this stuff. And I think the new man can open up and can you know cry at movies and to be perfectly honest that new man is a lot better than the old man you know so I, I don't know I just I think I've always been a person that really pushed against that you know I was a drama kid I I think that everybody should be able to open up and, and explain their emotions and I don't think everybody needs to I don't know project this you know strength all the time and i think it's actually when you're vulnerable that people will open up to you and, and in my career and in life i found that that's what's you know made me the the best friends that i have is that when you can be open i don't know i think i think you you think that people are going to judge you a lot more than they are and if they do you probably don't need them so i just kind of work with that i i wanted to talk about what dan just said and i completely kind of agree with him because at the end of the day, you know, the world wants man to be a man. But at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with opening up. There's nothing wrong with uh, being, you know, sensitive. It, if anything, you know, it's good to open up. It's like, you know, you want to let people know what you're feeling. You want to let people know what you're going through. Because at the end of the day, the more, the more you bottle things up, at the end of the day, it's going to affect you and everyone around you. Because your mood's going to change you know, and all these, all these things are going to happen. And, you know, the expectations, you know, arise because as a man, you know, you're expected to do so much. Um, so, yeah, no, I completely agree with you in terms of like, you know, the new man is, you know, opening up and being just be who you are at the end of the day. There's no one you have to, you don't have to show off to anybody that, you know, you're masculine. And so like that's, those things should come naturally. For sure. There's a... Uh... There's one piece that I, I want to talk about uh, that I leaned on during my four years, which is peer support and having a, a community. You know, one of the things I challenged, that one of the biggest things that I had a challenge uh, with was just feeling this loneliness, like it's only me. Uh, and 
um, you know, I met Joe through uh, a kidney related event and then peer support came through the next year um, for Toronto General specifically. And it was incredible uh, boost of, of just emotional support for me. And, uh, um, you know, I still do it to this day. Uh, so uh, reaching out, finding others that are perhaps in a similar situation uh, didn't come natural to me. And Sadia will attest, because the first call she made to me, I think I dismissed her. Um, but it just took me time to kind of realize, hey, you know, maybe there's something to this support group that I could get something out of. And it turned out there was a lot that I could get out of it. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to bring that up as it was an, in an incredible tool for me to, uh, to gain a little bit more confidence and feel better about my situation. Yeah, it's, it's motivating too, right? Because you all are doing so much. And, you know, like Harup talks about being in school and going through this in all different stages and he's still going on. And, you know, Ali, I don't know you as well, but just by your bio, like obviously you're not letting this stop you. So when you're around a bunch of people who are making it work, it's a lot more inspiring and it drives you to make it work. So I, I agree, your support's been great for that. Thank you. Um the other question I had was, is there any bad experiences that has taken place that you're comfortable sharing that either helped to clarify your past self or helped you to move towards a future self in terms of the body image confidence? That's deep. That's really getting in there. I, I wanna say something about, um something that, that was alluded to with regards to not knowing what someone's going through. Th this, this thing about like invisible diseases, invisible illness is something that has cropped up more and more. Uh, like I'm on TikTok and, and I, I see these kind of words. And um, I feel like my old self wouldn't have maybe acknowledged uh, what someone could be going through because there's a lot of masking going on when you have an invisible disease. When I think about, you know, my relationship with my coworkers, you know, I tell some of them, but I haven't told all of them, obviously, it's, you know, it's, it's neither here nor there, quite frankly. But uh, for the people that I have told, uh, you know, I mean, they really don't see me any different. And um, yeah, you, you just don't know what someone's going through. And that's something I've learned through going through this journey myself. Joe, you have your hand up? Yeah, I just uh, figured I could answer that question. I think a story that I think would be relatable to uh, the viewers. Um, well, one of the bad things I kind of found, and this happened, sort of came to me years after my first kidney failure, but I remember I mentioned how I was working and at the time I was working a job at the CN Tower and I was helping with a crew there that was fixing and painting the fiberglass panels on the outside at the top. And so my job was to climb up and turn off the antennas where they're going to be working, climb up first, do the whole, be the canary and test to make sure, yes, in fact, these things are off and it's safe for everyone to go out um, and do what they have to do. And this is when my kidneys were, during this, my kidneys were starting to fail and the lupus was flaring out of control. And so, you know, I had this, this, it's just like, it used to be no problem. And then all of a sudden it's getting harder every day to do. And my hands are swollen. There's like massively inflamed sausages and it's never going away. So it hurts just to, to climb the ladder rungs and my weight's going up and my muscle mass is going down. So it's getting harder and harder to pull myself through. And to the point that I start like dreading going to work and I'm like, I, I hope it rains today or there's some crazy storm and, and I don't have to do it, right? Like um, before things like before I ever got, you know, diagnosed and um, and I was, you know, limping everywhere, trying to set up antennas at other buildings and stuff. And, and I thought that I was doing everything I could to like push through and work hard, you know, be that guy who doesn't give up and, and, you know, make it work for the company and, and, you know, just, you know, trooper on. And I found out, you know, even though there was some heckling and stuff about how I look gimpy and, and these kinds of things, but I found out years later that one of the supervisors um, just thought I was lazy you know, even though I had these obvious visible symptoms and, you know, he just thought, you know, that I wasn't giving my all. And it really kind of struck me because I was like, man, in my perspective, I was trying so hard to not let this stop me from like completing these corporate objectives and our projects would be completed. And, 
you know, pushing through pain, like actual miserable pain to the point that I could barely walk and barely climb. And yeah, when I found out later that it totally was not, you know, valued, you know, it kind of made me feel like, well, why do I even, you know, why do I even put myself through that? You know, I should have been putting myself first, you know, instead of working till the bitter end until I finally crashed and couldn't, you know, do anything else and had to go to emerge and it was a whole big thing. And, you know, it was, so it was really, really disappointing to hear that, you know, someone I'd looked up to at the time, you know, had this negative viewpoint of me and didn't see, you know, that I was struggling despite like pushing through this, just saw that I wasn't doing enough, you know? Thanks, Joe. That's really uh, an important lesson, isn't it? Because there, the issue is, as the patient or as the person with the chronic disease, you always have to be in charge of your self-care. And it doesn't matter sometimes how much you do, people may not understand what actually is going on and what effort it takes to get up and come to dialysis or go to a clinic. So thank you for sharing that. And I, I know that um, I know that in dealing with my own clients, uh, to get to a place of confidence and positivity takes a lot of work and it has a toll on mental health. And I'm just wondering if anybody can comment on how this impacts over time on your mood and how you get up in the morning just to get up and do those day-to-day -day activities that you need to do. Yeah, I mean, obviously quite a bit. And, you know, something that I found the transition from um, trying to keep my uh, my GFR as high as possible while I was failing, you know, I, I had a job and, and that was actually kind of easy because I mean, like my job was to keep that kidney function high, as high as it could be. So, you know, that that's what I pushed myself into. So I didn't think about a lot of things and I was actually okay for that time. I actually found it a little harder after transplant because, you know, I, I don't want to say that it wasn't as perfect as I thought it was, because overall it's it's great. You know, uh, I'm sitting in the Dominican Republic right now on vacation and it's awesome, you know? So I don't want to complain about it at all, but there was a lot of, you know, also doing it during COVID where I was alone for a lot of that as well. And, you know, I also had to like rebuild up walking because my broken leg flared up again. So, you know, pushing through a lot. And I think what I found through it is that, you know, I do need to take better care of my mental health. I was a person that pushed through that a lot with my job. I, I, I definitely put myself secondary to, to my job. And, you know, so that was trying meditation and trying yoga and breathing and going to acupuncture and, and eventually, you know, talking to a therapist and trying out antidepressants, which I'm still on a, a low base amount. And I find that just helps me actually kind of keep a level head about everything as opposed to focusing on one day where I maybe feel the, the medication a little bit or I feel anxious because of the medication. So I don't, I, I tried a lot of things. This is what works me really well right now. It might not be forever and I might try something different, but I think it's about trying things. And if that thing doesn't work, not, you know, getting down about it, but just kind of crossing it off and going on to the next thing and, and really just finding the thing that gets you through. Thank you, Dan. Anybody else want to comment on that? Uh, I do want to say something about the mental health piece because uh, I'm a bit of an emotional person. And um, yeah, there were days where I, 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 you know, I had a lot of crying sessions and just either, you know, like, who am I? Like, like my identity just was just in question and now that i'm transplanted i'm starting to see the old me come back it's taken some work but you know during dialysis yeah it was it was it was tough i had to have those crying sessions though i can kind of uh feel a little bit better and you know uh I, I like camping and i ended up you know going on some really remote excursions and that really helped reconcile the gravity of, of my situation in, in that, you know, what if I can't do this again for whatever reason? What if I can never get a kidney? And, and I, I just ended up pushing myself to going to more remote adventurous trips in the event that, you know, maybe next year I won't be able to do this because who knows what my kidney situation will be like. You know, I am hopeful I get a kidney, 
But who knows what happens? Maybe I don't get a kidney for whatever reason. There are people out there that don't qualify to get a transplant or that it's very unlikely that they do get a kidney. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I really went to some extremes uh, in terms of some of the activities I did to try to uh, cope with uh, you know, some of the feelings that I had uh, while I was on dialysis. Thank you, Laura. I think that's a really powerful statement and I really appreciate uh, Dan's comment on you know, needing to do something different for herself and the self-care and reaching out to professional help. I think that takes courage and I'm really glad that you were able to share that as well, Dan. Um, there was a question in the Q&A uh, around sexual functioning, unfortunately, uh, sexual performance. Unfortunately, um, we're not, this webinar is not going to be able to give advice or focus on sexual performance, but that is probably an issue that is on a lot of people's minds uh, because it's not uncommon in a general population. And of course, it's pretty common with the kidney population as well. But I think at this, unfortunately, we're not able to respond that in more than that. But I'm just wondering if there are any other questions or answers. This will be a good time to ask our panelists. Okay, so we don't have any uh, Q and A's right now. So I have one final question for you all to kind of think about and respond if you could. The question is that, um, the negative view of ourselves is just always sometimes underneath the surface and it, it can come out when we are in acute situations or when we least expect it, that the doubt can, can, can be there. And I'm just wondering, how do you handle those negative perceptions of yourself, your, your body image or your self-esteem or confidence when something new or revisiting something you thought you had resolved surfaces again? I mean, to be honest, I, I don't think it's that different from the way everybody else does. You know, ev everybody in the world has those doubts at times, has those things that, you know, they see a picture of someone else and they look really good. And I, I think it's just putting it in context in that you're not different just because we're going through this very specific thing. Everybody's going through something at some level. So you know, I, I really do think it's it's leaning on loved ones, the people who around you who build you up. And if you don't have those people, finding those people because they're really important. And, you know, it's in life, it's, it's just it's not all about that. If you can kind of get past the, the whole idea that we need to be perceived in a way it really isn't like life really just is about having you know, good moments with people you love. And if you are around those people, it, it'll just get easier. Thank you, Dennis. Anybody else want to comment on that? I think you're dead on. Yeah, I agree with Dan. And also I learned a lot about myself in terms of resilience. Um, um, sometimes, uh, you know, I would doubt myself as to whether I could do something or not and um or work through something and you know I, I have learned a lot about uh you know myself in terms of what i'm actually capable of doing and, and and it really helps you know in terms of the next situation that comes um so yeah there is a, a question uh that perhaps you can respond to as well any one of you or all of you the question is do you have routines either diet or exercise or that you swear by that help you get through? Um, routines or, uh, for me, I'd say that would help me get by would be the gym for hundred uh, percent and playing basketball. Uh, I would actually do that also on dialysis, like playing basketball. Uh, that was something that would really, really get me through just my negative thoughts and just going to the gym and just kind of shooting around and, you know, just playing with others just to kind of get me out of that that little negative zone. So that's something that would keep me going. <clears throat> like that was like a routine I would have. And now I, my routine is the gym. Like that's something that no matter, no matter what happens, I don't miss the gym because I know that once I'm in the gym, I'm in my own world. Um, you know, I'm happy. And, you know, after, especially, especially once you start to see positive results, which I have seen uh, amazingly actually 
uh, that's something that keeps me going and wanting me to go even more further because it makes me, you know, it's a lot to make me happy. And I'm like, you know what, like I'm achieving the goal that I've always wanted to achieve. So that's one routine that I'm going to keep to myself, um, you know, keep going for, for a long time. Thank you, Ali. You're absolutely right. Structure, that's a really great question. I'm glad you're asked. Uh, structure is really important because it helps you get through um, the day-to-day -day activities, especially when they're having a bad day. But that time of self-care where you protect your time and that's about you and your health, I think you're absolutely right. Routines are absolutely critical. We know this with children. We need to be given structure, but we also need the routines as adults as well, especially when you're dealing with chronic disease management or transplant. Thank you so much for that. Oh, we're on. Are you muted? Joe, go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry. I was just recognizing that we we're all muted. Uh, I was going to say for routines, I think I, um, this is going to seem like silly obvious, but uh, dialysis. Um, like when I was doing it at home with PD and stuff like that, I would make it a priority to always do my treatment every night. Um, you know, even if I'm coming home late from an event or whatever, and I'm tired and I obviously the last thing I want to do is set up and slug like 10 or 20 pounds with fluid to get all the machine going. But it's like, it just made it a habit to never miss it because missing those treatments just makes it harder to keep everything else in mind, blood work, energy nausea, all that stuff, you know, you miss the treatments, they add up and they take the toll on the body. Um, diet wise, I come back to, like, you find your favorites and you keep coming back to them. And maybe they're not always your favorites, but you know that they work. Like uh, I use egg whites a lot because they're so low, pro low phosphorus, but high protein. Um, there's a product boost, Just Whey. It's Just Whey protein, completely isolated, comes with little to no sodium and, other, and potassium and all that in it. Um, you know, finding you some meals that you like, you know, for me, I use a lot of olive oil as well, trying to gain weight. Um, it's hard to, you know, obviously it's hard to get a lot of calories with the sodium thing. So I would just try to add olive oil to like everything, throw it in soup, throw it on bread, throw it on whatever. Sometimes I just take tablespoons of it. There's a time where I was just doing like two or three tablespoons, like twice or three times a day, just to add like four or 500 calories extra. So yeah, kind of finding, finding your stride there and I'm just starting to get back into the exercise again after the whole superior vena cava syndrome and the clot blockage. And so I'm, right now I'm doing just body weight stuff, like squats, dips, um, pull-ups, trying to get that you know general whole body strengthening together. And, and I started a, a cardio program recently too, which, um, to just kind of like set a goal of working up to like a 5K jog. And, and uh, just because I've been so low on stamina for so long and I'm coming up on transplant surgery. So I just figured I should try to like harden up my body for the, the upcoming surgery. So, um, so far it's been working good, but I've been making that a habit as well, three times a week and, and I don't miss it, so. Thanks, Joe. Uh, we're just coming to the end and there was a question to describe your routine. Unfortunately, we won't have time to get into that question. Someone was asking if you can describe your routines. Uh, Robert is also correct to say that CKD is always about routine. Joe, you had a, I just want to invite uh, folks to have a last statement. Uh, and I wanted to thank every single one of you for your vulnerability and, and sharing openly and getting this conversation started, which is much needed. But I'd like the final word to be left to the panelists if you'd like to say a word or, or a short phrase that helps you get through. Who wants to go first? I'll we'll start with you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Nominated myself. Uh, okay. Um, one, the, the piece of advice I could leave you with is sort of don't spend time dwelling on how life could have been if you didn't have kidney disease or think about how your kind of path has become elongated and you, as you've struggled through all these things and you're behind where you think you should be compared to your peers. Um, a, a good saying I like is uh, the path in excess leads to the palace of wisdom. So it doesn't really matter what path you've gone down. All of that's life experience. All of that is like building your character and, and developing who you are. And it's all part and parcel to who you are. So, you know, don't ever think that it's, it's taking away because it's all adding. Thank you, Joe. Anybody else? Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll say one thing. Um, I really wanted to say that, you know, it's very, very important as a dialysis patient and, and also as a transplant patient to, 
to always reach out to, to somebody, to always ask for help, to always be, uh, you know, ask to, for someone to be there for you. Because, you know, the more, the more you close yourself off, the more lonely you are going to feel. And that's the worst thing that you can do to yourself. Uh, whether it's, you know, you want to open up to a friend, a family, or, you know, peer support. Uh, it's very, very important to, to reach out and ask for help and just, you know, talk about the things that you're going through. So it's very important that I'm very big on that. So I'll state it all. Thank you. What about Dan and Roy? So I second the peer support. Like that's been a great resource, I think, for everybody here. So, you know, getting together with the Kidney Foundation and doing the meetings and stuff has been awesome. Yeah, for me, I just reiterate uh, the fact of, you know, keep doing the things you love. Uh, I have lots of photos of me camping during, um, you know, my dialysis days. I even took Joe camping. That's how confident I was as it relates to, you know, how safe it could be uh, going out into the backcountry. And, you know, I'm going to cherish those moments. I'm going to cherish the trip I had with Joe. And, you know, uh, it makes me feel better about my time at doing dialysis, you know, because it's quite possible I might have to be doing dialysis again. The kidneys don't last forever. But anyways, I would remind everybody, keep doing the things you love. So mine, I think, you know, involves just kind of persistence and, you know, fortitude has been something that's talked a lot about. And, you know, I think we're all talking about positivity, which is important, but there's been times where positivity seems almost impossible. So there's this movie I saw that just when I got diagnosed uh, called Jojo Rabbit, and there's a quote at the end of it. And that quote is no feeling is final. So it's something I said to myself a lot that, you know, when I was admitted to the hospital because my immune system crashed and I had no neutrophils, you know, I, that was one of those painful things I ever went through on a weekend, but I just knew that this isn't how I'd feel forever. And eventually I'd feel better. And I think it can be used the opposite too. And when you're feeling perfect and you're, you're not thinking about it at all to, you know, take that in because that might not be forever either. So on, on both sides, you know, it will just continue to grow. And, and those hard times, they seem impossible to get over in the moment. You know, I can't even remember my transplant surgery anymore. Like it, it feels like a dream. So I, I just think we're, we're all so capable of moving on. And I just, I just kept saying that to myself over and over. Thank you so much. I think we have about a minute left. Um, I just wanted to say it's been a privilege to moderate this, this dynamic um, open sharing uh, between you as, as men on, on dialysis or transplant. I think this has been a very helpful a way to start this conversation. And I hope that uh, we continue the conversation uh, with your peers. And, and I do agree with the idea of peer support and opening up. I think that is the key thing for everyone to consider. I'm just going to turn it down back to Sadie or Lydia, if you wanted to close. Thank you very much, Jose. And look, I feel really honored to have been here today and very, very grateful to our, um, our panel, our moderator and participants, and particularly to our panel for the honesty and the courage you had in sharing your stories today. Um, so thank you so much for that. The Kidney Foundation is committed to providing information and educational resources about kidneys and kidney disease. We invite you to visit the Kidney Community Kitchen for recipes, information and tools to help you manage your renal diet. Through our regional branch offices, we offer advice and support about accessing services within the healthcare system, assisting people to access other supports in their community and offering assistance and skills for self-advocacy. We invite you to connect with us if you have further questions, to speak with someone in your community or to access further educational materials and resources.